And now it's time for Omniversica, the greatest show on the internet, with your hosts Dan Schneider and Art Durkey. Welcome to Omniversica. We are this month talking about poetry, specifically the poetry scene in the Twin Cities, and one of its uh, most interesting um, groups, the Uptown Poetry Group, which has a long-standing critique and writing group. Not a support group, but a critique group. Yeah, and uh, the Uptown Poetry Group, uh, actually, uh, last month was our last meeting, and we had 200 consecutive meetings uh, from... uh, June of 95 through uh, September of 03, and we've got uh, four people who uh, over the years were fairly regular or semi-regular to the group, and we also have a couple of other poets later in the show who uh, uh, I've also known in the Twin Cities scene. Uh, Basically, I had started the Uptown Poetry Group uh, because I'd gotten kicked out of another local poetry group that I won't mention lest be sued or something Hmm. for defamation, but uh, I had been to poetry groups also in the New York City area, and one of the things uh, that's always been pr- particularly noxious about most poetry groups is people want approbation rather than uh, actual uh, critique to improve their work. And for me, you know, mm-hmm. if, if I want my ass kissed, I'm not going to go to a group of strangers. You can go to the AOL poetry chat rooms for that, where yeah. basically that's all that happens on there. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, we'll talk, I want to talk a little bit about poetry. In the rest of the show, we're going to hear some uh, uh, segments of poetry from some of the people who will be uh, joining us. The first two people up here are two female uh, members, uh, or I don't know if I could say members, participants in the Uptown Poetry Group over the years. My wife, Jessica Schneider, who's for the last uh, four years or so has been coming, uh, and also in the last year or so, uh, Jen Hanel, uh, another uh, poet who started coming to the group. And I know I had put uh, uh, stuff out in like local newspapers occasionally, and that's, I think, where Jen, you found out about the poetry group. Now, have you ever gone to any other poetry groups beforehand? Um, I, I went to a few events at the Loft, uh-huh. and I think I was just irritated with the material they had, and yeah. it was Why? everything. It was everything, and I was sort of really just pretentious, like, nature poetry and, and nothing very inventive or new. Everything that you read in any kind of literary journal that's published by the same people that are writing for it, basically. So. And have you read poetry most of your life, or what? Um, I've wanted to write since I was a kid. I wrote mystery stories when I was young. <laughs> and w- I didn't get into poetry till probably past three years. And what kind of poets uh, have you been interested in? What, what kind of writing attracts you? I think uh, the very first one to really inspire me into trying my own uh, is Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Ferlinghetti? Who mm-hmm. I actually got to meet uh, a couple months ago mm-hmm. in the cities. Mm-hmm. And he was everything I thought he wasn't going to be, (laughs) which was an actually pretty kind human being from what it seemed. And actually, he's he's not a bad poet. I I know I've got his uh, collected poems, uh, These Are My Rivers, and and he's much better than a lot of other bigger name beatnik types. Um, But uh, now, have you ever been into, like, I know my wife, Jessica, has been into, you know, Sylvia Plath and uh, Anne Sexton and all the the suicidal kind of crap? I mean... No. (laughs) That's, uh, I have a big problem with those kind of female poets, as well as uh, a lot of feminist poetry. I feel that if you're really going to succeed anywhere in any kind of art form, your best bet is to keep things more humanist, and that doesn't close off your audiences. A lot of feminist poetry and that kind of thing tends to, they keep themselves in the boxes that they're writing about. And Are they all like writing for each other, I mean for the same crowd kind of thing, you mean? Or? Um, uh, I believe that's part of it, but I also believe that it's just the angst behind it that no. okay. just keeps them in the same mm-hmm. genre. Yeah, it's and I think the, 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 the problem with most political poetry is the politics comes over the art. You can write good political poetry or have political art, but the art has to come first. And if you're going to make a statement, well, fine, that it makes you a nice human being or whatnot, but it doesn't make you an artist. I mean, I've done these essays uh, called This Old Poem Essays that I've got on my website where, I mean, over and over, I, I just did a, was writing an essay today on a local poet named Deborah Keenan, and she's got a, a poem called uh, Garlic Trees Incest. And the, the basic thrust of the poem is that garlic, trees, and incest are the only three nouns that, are, uh, are, that anyone in any culture can know about. Now, first of all, that's totally wrong since Eskimos have no word for, the, for, for trees. Um, garlic. Or, or garlic is what I know. And, and, and <laughs> the idea, too, that incest is taboo. Well, yet there have been cultures where, where incest and inter, 
intermarriage between close family members has been encouraged. And so it's a, it, the, the poem is just a screed, but it's a screed without any basis in reality. And that's just the basic problem with political poetry is, mm. you know, mm. you have to put the art first. I mean, art is a craft. And if the poem is not well written, it doesn't matter how how good the sentiment is. I'd rather read a, ba- a good poem by a Nazi than some bad poem by, you know, some tree hugger or vice versa. <laughs> now, Jessica, I know, speaking of uh, Anne Sexton and uh, Sylvia Plath, I know that, you know, when we first met you, uh, th- those are two of your biggest influences along with Emily Dickinson. They seem to be the holy trinity of young female poets, Dickinson, Plath, and Sexton, at least for the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, now, I know you've been writing most of your life. Um, who are some of the poets other than those three, though, that have influenced you? Um, Elizabeth Bishop quite a bit. Also, some Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, How about male poets? Yeats and Stevens and Jeffers also. Um, I prefer American poets over um, foreign poets, though I do like Rilke, uh, love Rilke a lot, but... Um, the Americans are really what got me into it. Um, I don't know if I grew up in, you know, Europe or something. I don't know if I would have necessarily loved, started liking poetry with European poetry. I don't. It doesn't move me as much. That's just how I feel about it. So, um, but those are some of the, the bigger names. That I know. You, I know when we had you on the show a couple of uh, months ago, uh, talking with uh, a couple of uh, poet critics that we had on, you had some peas, but you didn't get out uh, all of your bitches. So rant a little bit, like you usually do to me at home, about what you don't like about poetry. Um, um, circle around this way. Oh, yeah, I'm the side of the mic. There you go. Okay. Yeah, a lot um, just the the whole constant um, pat on the backs, the support groups. Um, you know, I'm. I'm a good person, you know, like me, this and that. I just find that very irritating. Love constantly. me, love my poem. Yeah. Or hate my poem, hate me. Basically. the flip side. Basically, yeah. yeah. And then the fact that, that the these people who, who, all these people who win these prizes, these Pulitzers or whatever it is, um, they, they're they all on the same committee and they all vote for each other. And it's just really silly, you know, so I don't see what value well, that has. One, one, of the, one of the most ridiculous things, who is the old woman who dropped dead and left $100 million to Poetry Magazine? I don't remember. Ensuring that Dog Girl will continue through midway through the next millennium or this millennium. And I mean, I, I, I can't for the life of me understand that. I mean, poetry, for those who don't know, Poetry Magazine, was founded in the early uh, 20th century and for the first 20 or 30 years it was a fairly relevant in, in, in introducing uh, poets such as uh, Robert Frost or T.S. Eliot to, to larger audiences but like most mainstream poetry magazines I mean there just isn't good poetry being published in the last 20 or 30 years. That doesn't mean that there aren't good writers. I mean, I, I, I take four or five of the main people that have been coming to the Uptown Poetry Group for the last few years and I can say that they are a quantum leap over the published poetry, whether that's someone like a John Ashbery, whether that's someone like an Untazaki Shangi, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a gay or, or white or lesbian or black. Most of the poetry is just devolved down to, to this me, 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 this, this uh, personalized, I call it personalism, not confessionalism, because it's mm-hmm. basically just about the sort of the, the sucking in of, of the self or the, the projection of the self out into the cosmos is the most relevant thing. And I, I personally get bored with myself. I don't like writing about myself. I mean, occasionally I will do if I have a particularly strong memory. And I know art, you know, you opine a little bit because most of your poetry is more nature-based. Most of it I would actually call it transpersonal. I'm not really interested in the biography of somebody's individual life. I'd rather find out what's going on in the exact moment. You know. The thing that bothers you know. me, though, is um, how there's this myth that, that poetry needs to be understood by all. And the thing is, it's not. It's an acquired taste. What you mean, like... Uh, Make it easy to understand so any idiot can get it, can oh, get okay. the metaphor. And it's like, you know, it's an acquired taste. Not, you know, most people don't like it. It's too whatever. But... Um, I don't think that qualifies for dumbing it down or making it watery. Well, you should, I think you should always aim high because if you look at the art that survives, it's generally been beyond what was at that current time. But as, as society progresses, and I 
only a Luddite <laughs> is going to think that society hasn't progressed. You know, people catch up to it. Then the people who are the good artists during that time are ahead, and it takes, you know, however many uh, decades or maybe even centuries for people for it to, bec to come into a realization that this was a good piece of work. And, I mean, that's just been the pattern over and over again, that it, it, it just seems so silly that people would, would want to intentionally dumb down their work. Now, Jen... Uh, have you ever been to any local poetry readings or anything, you know, other than poetry groups? Um, th there's not really much out there, uh, mainly slam. And yeah. I have a huge problem with slam yeah. in general. Yeah, just yeah for me too. What I said before, mainly, it's a lot of the poetry is very, uh, it's, it's more rants. It doesn't really have a lot of substance to it. It's been things that have been said time and time again. And um, I don't know, and there is a lot of, even if it's really awful, you got support there and those poets just aren't going to grow I mean I think that's what's been different with being part of the UPG is because because of that mm -hmm. because you get to be around people who are really trying to improve their work as opposed to just trying well, to... Well, you were there. I won't mention the fellow's it. name, but there, you were there the, the one time we had the psychotic <laughs> yeah. fellow who came who had his anti-George Bush uh, rant. Yeah. And, you know, I'm no big George Bush fan, but, you know, when I told him that, uh, you know, this is not even a poem, and he asked me, is, can't you say anything good? And I said, no. <laughs> and, you know, it, it was a terrible poem. But people come there and... Yeah, but the spoken word scene has been taken over by that. I mean... Oh, yeah. The spoken word scene doesn't even have the quality of somebody like a Laurie Anderson it's all this it's all this you know I, I got upset at my I got upset when I cut my finger cleaning cleaning tuna for my cat so I hate the world mm -hmm. and it's done it's mostly hip-hop delivery these days too but it's a, but it's a separate art form spoken word is different from poetry in my point of view and people can argue well, but, but there's no. a lot of overlap there the problem is is you know you get a collection like like that New York and poets collection which is basically the texts a lot of a lot of a lot of these slam people and they they don't hold up on paper they may be delivered in an interesting manner you may be kind of tapping your foot and interested while they're performing it but it doesn't work as poetry because it because in written form it's 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 not interesting and i think poetry has to be spoken and written both in order to succeed well in 86 or 87 i remember i went to a brooklyn loft one one night i forget the girl i was trying to bang at the time <laughs> but i went i went i went to see see karen finley and she she's... now we know why you got into poetry yeah anyway <laughs> yeah well she was she, she brought me and i saw this woman karen finley who's since become notorious and this was 17 18 years ago whatever it was and you know her basic thing was just ranting and smearing chocolate and feces on herself now in the 20 years or so she, basically she's evolved to a smearing feces chocolate and blood on herself and that's been her whole evolution as an artist mm -hmm. but anyway i want to talk a little bit more about the poetry scene we're going to take a break and listen to some poems from some of the poets who are here and when we get back we'll talk a little bit more with jessica and jen cindra Holm, before uncrack the egg Reset the unspun sun to its pre-lighted what-if, all beg and be. Unmask the dormant door, protect the dark until dark, return to the dark, restore, hand over hand on the silk thread raveling to revel inside the spider's belly all soon and none. What fossil print rolls backward from toe to heel to footless, unstepped stop. Is it possible to be a shoeless guest in the unfurnished house of space? I want to beguile as desire in waiting, the notes not yet a song unwrapping aria, corona. Undo the deed to all source and hum. May 1. The TV's desert screen in the corner, the recycled dead. Attention! Aftermath of war and personal 40, I don't recognize what bursts in this garden. Code orange, code gray, missiles breaking earth apart, collagen breaking down. How to spring space into suspension opening sleeps, compacted joints, like the brief weeks of lilacs when the season throws its aroma wide as love. One, the start of something like yes. 
This May, I labor my year's pulses and pulls while the stock's work shows its homeland colors, skin its extravagant limits. Ah, Beltane, snake uncoiling, shaking the ground for the dance and the crack of it, resolve of Mayday's thistled first, thirst. So, you want to kiss me? Trace a lilac across my lips. May I suggest my hand on your face like this? On the line, promise promises attention. Call it revolution. Who said anything except time? Well, I want to just uh, start off this segment briefly talking about uh, the Twin Cities uh, poetry or open mic scene. When I first, I moved here in 91 and I got into the scene, I guess, around 93 and a really terrific place that actually has been since torn down was a little bar called the Irish Well in St. Paul and they had a good reading series for about two or three years. There's another place uh, in downtown St. Paul called the Bad Habit Cafe that had a good reading series and I remember for about a year in 95, 96, uh, Ground Zero, which is a uh, a bondage kind of domination club down uh, uh, in northeast Minneapolis. Or, yeah, northeast Minneapolis. Uh, they have a bar called the Front Bar, and they had a reading series for about a year that went well. The last uh, reading series in the Twin Cities that w did well for a couple of years was at the Artist Quarter in St. Paul, uh, and that went for about two years, being pretty good. Then around '98, it became sort of an all open mic thing it could be poetry anything and it basically went downhill mm -hmm. and it just it's just interesting too uh when i started the uptown poetry group in 95 there was a a, a paper called shout which was about the spoken word scene which at that time i remember there were about 12 or 15 poetry groups that were listed uh, in each monthly edition and in the interim virtually every group and now even the uptown poetry group uh has gone uh, the way of the dinosaur and i think things go in cycles now yeah. uh yeah. the mid 90s i think uh it started with the new eurekans i mean you can say what you will and that the, well they you know you can say what you will about the quality of the work but they didn't inspire a new wave of interest yeah which was which was all a good thing i think yeah, and you know there were there were people who became sort of MTV starlets for a year or so, and right. and uh, um, but now I know Jessica, you haven't really been to many uh, uh, poetry readings, but uh, Jen, you have. Um, have you ever seen anyone that that you've uh, thought was uh, really interesting and whatever? Um, there there was uh, and. I wouldn't remember her name, so yeah. that's the problem. Uh, there was a show I saw at Kieran's, yeah. and there's a girl who was who just did did a poem about it was some episode in her life that I think involved sexual abuse, but it was um, it wasn't like the other kinds mm -hmm. you hear. It was just it was really well done. Um, I know she she's there pretty regularly. Kieran's has one now on. Tuesdays, I think. Is it still going? Because I, I, I'm pretty sure, uh, unless they sometimes they switch up the day of the week yeah. that it falls on. But and that one's that one's good. Uh, there's not a whole lot of attendance at it, but it's um, worthwhile. What I really like is a uh, Balls Cabaret yeah. down in. I think that's I went a good there for about three three straight years. I performed there. It's at midnight though, so it's uh, a and it's it's, it's alcohol free and. Well, yeah, That's a well, lot of things people don't want to quit drinking on Saturday night so they can go perform sober. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I actually have the two cabarets that have been going pretty well. I always thought Balls was better than there was another pa cabaret called Patrick's Cabaret, which actually paid their performance. But I always thought that Balls was more spontaneous and the people weren't paid. They'd get up there and they actually in general did more and tried more but the reason i bring up the the idea about seeing anyone good was uh, i recently uh uh occasionally google names and occasionally i've googled names of old friends and people like there's my best friend from uh from elementary school I, I hooked up with who was on the show Mark right. Taylor the, mm -hmm. the soul music expert and uh, also the girl I first uh, had fallen in love with uh, but I found these two poets that I had uh, gone to this uh, writing f forum in 1987 I'm hoping that uh, I'll connect with both of them I, I've sent emails to them and one of them has responded because I'd like to uh, I, I don't think either of them are writing poetry anymore but both of them are really young talented poets and one of the things that really frustrates me is over the years and I had I had talent as a young poet. She's seen some of my early stuff, and you can tell even in stuff that's really bad poems, you can see good lines, and you can see how they're bad, but they're just, you know, a little bit fuzzy or a little bit off, you know. Uh, there's a difference between a poem that has no chance at all and a poem that's bad that could be good. 
and the thing that frustrates me is so many of these younger poets uh, they they never they never continue on and there are people who don't have any talent at all and like the Yates poem The Second Coming they persist and they persist yeah. and you see these yeah. 50 and 60 year Jack old people a lot of them have websites yeah. Yeah. they have websites they trying to promote themselves and yeah you know. but I mean it, Adam Sandler it, it, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really frustrating that the people that don't have the talent persist and persist and persist and you see some of these other people and there have been a handful of people off the top of my head that have come to the poetry group that have had talent and yet you know it's just a passing phase for a couple of years and then they go off they they go into dance or they go into theater or drama or this or that and they leave the poetry behind and I just I just don't know what it is I think it's because people and you, I know you probably agree with me Jessica people think that because you can pick up a pen anyone can be a writer or anyone can be a poet whereas you'd, if you have to buy a guitar or if you have to go out and buy you know canvases and, and oils to be a painter it's a bigger investment I think poetry is the easiest thing to write and also the most difficult. It's easiest because it takes 10 lines and poof, you got something terrible, but hey, you can call it a poem. At least when you write a bad novel, it takes, you know, 200 pages of that. <laughs> well, speaking so. speaking of 10 lines, one of a, a fellow who isn't here tonight, a fellow named Bruce Ario, uh, uh, he's, he's one of the people, I know he always uh, said he thought uh, that the Uptown Poetry Group would be so, similar to uh, the Algon Algonquin Roundtable, but as far as I know, the only person I ever know, know who whose name even rings a bell is Dorothy Parker from there uh, yeah and Bruce is a fellow who actually developed a free verse form ten lines of four stanzas three lines three lines three lines and one line that we call an aereo and in fact I just edited a couple of manuscripts uh, for him and he's an example I think he's the closest thing that I can think of to a really modern day Emily Dickinson in that I think in a hundred years you look at some of his poems they're so at, at his best poems are so simple that you think anyone can write them but I know yeah, art and other lot, people there's a lot of layers in right. that though and you know Robert Newkirk one of the people who will have on a little bit later uh, one time at the poetry group Uptown Poetry Group had uh, uh, we ha had like a, a little contest where we were trying to write areas which right. are these ten line forms and you can do the ten line form but Bruce has a certain intonation he's got a certain yeah. thing where the last line takes off and it's something that I think of all the poets that I've got here and all the poets I've known, his poems could be big mainstream because they are short enough that, you know, right. they have that Maya Angelou seeming one, quality. One page thing. Right. Yeah. They yeah. seem to be as simple as right. uh, as Maya Angelou, but they're not simplistic like a Maya Angelou right. poem. And and they're not doggerel like McEwen. Yeah. Though they're as approachable in some ways. Yeah, and in fact, the, the, the non aerial manuscript that I sent around, uh, mm -hmm. I actually uh, uh, took for the title, I, I, I titled his manuscript divining because we've talked before about the Robert Peters essay divining rod right. about uh, where some of the the lines of, of bad poems from big name poets were put next to Rod McEwen lines and you couldn't tell the difference and it just show it just shows yeah. you how much the name right. the, the brand name of a poet influences people in their criticism especially when they know in advance yeah. Jessica any comments um th th I think that's a main problem is that um, people think that they can't get beyond the print. They think people believe things because it's because it's in print. Oh, you know, uh, Adrian Rich wrote that. Oh, she's famous. Oh, so this has to be good, you know, and it's not or whatever. And um, I, I just don't understand that. I don't think people can really separate it. I don't know. Well, that's the thing about about with our poetry group. It, I think it's it's probably the only poetry group that I that uh, I've been involved with where people. You know, I mean, I can like art and know him for a few years. I can like this person and whatnot. But if the poem is bad, the, the best thing to, to do is to come out and say this is bad because what what is what is the purpose of, of, of going on, you know, without getting critique? Why would you want to come to a group, in my opinion, just to, just to get, get you know, uh, positive feedback if it's not warranted? Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, I, I said this um, the last UPG, that I appreciate more the negative because I'm reminded that it's not a support group. And then I, I appreciate then when it is, you know, you do get praise that it's genuine. Yeah. and Well, you, it's honest. It's honest. It's yeah. honest. And one of the things, too, one of the, early in the first year or two, I remember I brought a poem about Custer's Last Stand to the poetry group. And I remember there was, and I think, Don, you might have been at, at this. There was this uh, really heavyset blonde woman who came who was a friend of this uh, woman named Esther. And I remember she, was, she wrote a terrible poem about sitting in a cafe writing poems, which we've seen that poem 10,000 times if we've ever seen it. 
And she was basically very dismissive and very hostile. And I don't know maybe if Sindra might have even been there at that one. Sindra's helm has come to two or three poetry groups over the years. But I remember she was very dismissive and very hostile about people. And when her poem came up, I mean, people, even other than myself, naturally pointed out how really bad it was. I remember when my poem came up, uh, people gave, you know, they good or bad little things. But she made, the, this woman made a flippant offhand comment that, uh, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if the poem was told backwards or, or she made some comment about time so it just stuck in my mind and I basically broke the poem up and, and divided it in, into different time fragments and it made the poem a lot better my point being that, that even if you have an idiot you can sometimes get a good comment from someone who's an idiot if you listen so you can't you can't be dismissive when I've gone to a lot of other poetry groups if you go to poetry readings you have someone sitting on high as a poobah saying well you know confessionalism blah 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 or the only abstract this thisanism that that's the only way and it, it, it's so ridiculous and i know i've pointed out a lot of times when i write my essays you know you take some of this reasoning and it makes absolutely no sense i did an essay on helen venler who's a, a noted poetry critic and I, I i forget the actual passage but it makes absolutely no sense i mean you think if you people think that if you can put you know in a paragraph four or five polysyllabic words that somehow you're making a convincing argument but that it, it, it isn't. It's, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, listen to a few more poems now. Um, and uh, do Jen or Jess have any uh, final comments to make? Well, if not, we're going to listen to a few more poems and we're going to bring on another couple of poets who participate in the Uptown Poetry Group. So here are some poems. Jessica Schneider's Interiors. The barberry tree where rain gathers white moss, evening walks under Orion. William is too old to wander, mornings recall in perfect poise. I remember my brother in the wood, those days neglect to follow the garden, unseen birds, dimension of hawthorn hedges, black and pointed. A moon overhangs cypress and thrush. Distant, it saddens the peas now beaten down, and the garden overrun with weeds. Was this all for memory? Once we were hollies lost among the green semicircles, places we walked as children, tottering summers that spin daisies upon the turf. Songs of the lark, we have outgrown them. Winter lifts you and I as window light crosses Dover. What needs you to be pressed strawberry flower, so stars under the plum-colored arc, freshness murmurs under your sky? Weathered watercolor, magnolia morn. A thousand shrouds, still it plies the eye with morning. How pleasing in spring, wishing earth, even if one falls to the feet with some heaviness at work, the deft loveliness can only outlast the ever made move on it. Crawling sense over another, corollas carrying a girl and her harp, the feather dusted fennel and seed, Dandelions beneath the rotten peach. These things, the quiet reach of reeds, a marvel at the sentry, a heart's pinch within an arrested frame. Name them. Overesteemed, airs blue as bonnets bells. The alternate oblong leaves held together, meant for every assorted weather. All right, we are back, and uh, the next couple of segments, we have uh, a couple of other people who participated over the years uh, in the Uptown Poetry Group, Don Moss and Robert Newkirk. Now, uh, Robert, uh, during the break here, you said uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the effect of being criticized, and are your feelings hurt? I, I think uh, your feelings get hurt a little bit. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any way to avoid it, and if you, if you think that it's important to uh, pretend that they're not, then, uh, you know, it's something that will go underground and affect your, your writing worse in the long run. You do get hurt, but uh, the important thing is to uh, let the hurt pass and then actually reflect on what was said and actually uh, shift uh, that to some extent uh, to, to see what's really useful and, and sometimes uh, actually you have to ignore the criticism. And while during the previous segment when people were, you know, talking about the distinction between a purely support group for writers and, and uh, a critique group, mm -hmm. um, it came to mind, you know, some of my experiences. Uh, in particular, uh, I thought of two poems that were actually um, 
poems that uh, their first versions were made uh, as long as 12, 15 years ago. And here I am now in the Twin Cities and I'm, you know, revising a lot of old stuff, <coughs> seeing mm -hmm. what's worth keeping and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. what, what uh, can just be like thrown away basically. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you know you grab a kernel from it and, and put it steal in the one good yeah. line and write yeah. something else around yeah. it. Yeah. I remember yeah. though during the past uh, three or four years, uh, two poems in particular from you know this older period, and they're both short poems, and they both got uh, hit on pretty strongly uh, in terms of the. Um, oh, hold on, we got a little telephone break here. Okay. The fax machine will answer. Hold on, we'll break here. Yeah. While the fax is coming in. Just pick up where you were and I'll So go. anyway, the last lines were, were jumped up. And, you know, the last line is, is that uh, sort of make or break it point. I mean, if you have a weak last line, uh, in my opinion, it's never going to be a, a really great poem. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <clears throat> I thought both of the last lines were, were uh, strong originally. And, and it, you have to take that home with you, that hurt. Mm -hmm. And you have to uh, uh, use it in some way. And uh, with one, I, I eventually saw that it was actually weak. And, you know, over a period of maybe two or three months, I, I worked on the line, uh, off and on, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came up with something that I think was a vast improvement mm -hmm. and is really satisfactory. And I, I can't, you know, thank the people more for having jumped on it. Because so it was a good pain. It was a good pain. I mean, it, it, it was the result of the pain was something good. Okay, that's what I mean. But yeah. you never personalized it. You never saw it as an attack on yourself, did you? Well, yeah, I, I'm not, you know, always able to separate those two things uh, completely. But to some extent, I can. And, and some people can't. Yeah. And th those are the people who, who maybe don't come back again. But mm -hmm. I mean, I can't avoid some sense of being hurt. But sure. It's a sense, what, what do you do? It's like when you get sick. And, uh, you know, that when you overcome a sickness, maybe you, you, you know, you see things better. Anyway, uh, the first one I improved greatly. Mm -hmm. And the second one, I, I, I was really unhappy to, to be criticized uh, for the last line, which I thought was, uh, you know, a stroke of genius. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, but I, it was a unanimous, uh, you know, verdict. <laughs> So I had to think very seriously about it, and it was upsetting. And uh, eventually, what I did um, was uh, I said, I'm not going to change it uh, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, but I'm going to change the line before it. Hmm. So I changed the line before it, and I think uh, that made the, the, uh, the original form of the last line uh, you know, successful. Okay. So anyway, in both cases, I took the criticism. I didn't like it, but I had to use it. Right. And uh, I think the result, even in one case, like uh, a more direct result, the other case, an indirect result. But if I hadn't been criticized, these poems, neither of them would have grown. Are you ever surprised by the critique? Pro or con? Pro or con. I mean, I, I say that because I brought in a couple of things that I've been very insecure about, and people have said it's the best thing of mine they've ever seen. And then I brought in things that I thought were pretty good, and they've been ripped to shreds. So it's, you know, it's not... In both cases, I think the criticism was correct. I guess what I'm getting at is expectations. I, I find it's difficult to predict what, what okay. the reaction is going to be. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I do get surprised. Sometimes it works out the way I think it's going to work out, but it, it's, it's hard to predict. Okay. And um, I do think about it in advance, though. Hmm. Um, like, you know, there's a bit of tension. Like, mm -hmm. this, is, this is going to be judged tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I think about it, but yeah. I, I mean, what, you got to lay it on the table and see what happens. Right. Yeah, I think I think this is part of what we have, you know, that's that's vaguely related to ten step. I mean, you know, to the the help because <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, these yes. words you put together do yes. come from your life. But I think the the Uptown Poetry Group, one aspect of it, it's not a beginner's group, and it's certainly not people who really need a little pat on the back all the time or otherwise oh you mean like, like beginner's encouragement um or? no i know i'm really thinking of those um you know let's say they just got off prozac 
and oh, and okay. you know and one of the things in their in their help group was poetry and you know you wrote these little poems about mummy and daddy and what mummy and daddy did to them or, or to you or, or, or garlic, or garlic and trees or, or garlic and trees right <laughs> yeah and um, mm-hmm. and uh, then they come to a group like this they you know they see the listing for it and they come to it and wham you know this is not nice gosh they don't have my feelings in mind first and you know dan you and i are you know not exactly ideological you know identical twins <laughs> but i think we both have fairly thick skin you know in that one sense but it can't be too thick because otherwise things that people say intending to be suggestions for improvements aren't going to get in either. Well, so you can't be impervious to any comments or, or you won't learn from anything. Sure. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, I'm just me, rephrasing that in my own words. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me just ask, because I know, uh, uh, Don, you uh, were going to hear uh, during the course of this show a selection from one of your, uh, your long poem, Dominions, and that was a poem that you were fairly regular to the group for the first four or five years, and you brought many uh, selections from that longer poem to the group, and I, th- I think it's one of the, the four or five best poems in, in long book-length poems probably in the last you know 50 to 100 years, and I think it's right up there with like the dream songs or... Or uh, uh, what is uh, the other guy, uh, the big tall guy, uh, uh, big six foot nine guy? Can't remember his name. Um, uh, Kingfish, no, Maximus. The Maximus poem. Oh, the Maximus poem. Sure. Creeley. Creeley. No, not Creeley. Uh, Olson. Charles Olson. Olson. Thank you. Thank Charles you. Olson. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks. For, thanks. <laughs> but I say, but I say that I say that too. One of the things that that I I, I really. That I I don't like cronyism, and when I when I have said that people's poems are good, whether it's Art's or my, or mine or Jessica's or or Robert's or anyone else that I've known, I really mean it. And and too often I think people think that when and I think it, the thing that is propounded throughout most of uh, uh, certainly criticism, certainly uh, reviewing uh, essays, is that people have this cronyistic attitude. And you know the most famous example is anyone who slept with Allen Ginsberg got a blurb on the back of their book when it inevitably came out. And you know, uh, you know, when I say that, Don, I mean your writing style. I think I think that that poem, and I don't know if you're ever going to write any other long poem like that, but. It, ha- it has a quality and there's a uniqueness to, to your voice. And that's one of the things I think that's a hallmark of quality is that it's almost the degree to which something is unique. When something is generic and can be written by 50 or 100 other people that you've met over the course of your lifetime, it's generally not good. But if there's a line, you know, I know just, just in hearing you read some of your poems earlier, I, I know, even if I didn't hear your voice, that that's a Don Moss line. I know, for example, that's an Art Durkee image, and that's one of the things. And I know when I first met you, I most people uh, in poetry groups, we met at a group called the Felius Pale Lilies, and then uh, a couple of years later, I saw the Uptown Poetry Group. And most people, I guess, would say that you're sort of like an Ashbery or a James Maryland in terms of your poetry. But uh, I, th- I think I think you take the best aspects of both. I'm just wondering. Uh, did you do you think that someone as yourself, who I would consider a more advanced writer, what did you get from say just the critical experience that you know versus say Robert, who probably considers himself uh, having just started out when he came to the group? Well, I mean, even if I had written, let's say I hadn't attended for a month, and so this poem I'm bringing has weathered through a few rewrites over a month, month and a half, and you know I'm already somewhat. I guess, objective, more so than I would be if it were quite fresh. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. When I bring things of that sort, you know, I've got a little chip on my shoulder because the form, the lines that have survived, uh, have at least argued their case to me. And so, you know, I will listen, but, you know, I'll, I'll argue back too because you know, I've, I've also been accused of writing things that are a little bit more difficult to understand. And you mean in the sense of more abstract? Or? Um, yeah, meaning that you've got to pay attention. If, oh, you know, okay. There's, there's a couple of meanings going on here and this and that, which of course happens in all. Don's points. not known for his limericks, right? <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, the point is, we could think we could name some poetry groups and mm-hmm. some attendees of mm-hmm. this one that don't have a lot of patience with anything that doesn't, well, that, that departs too much from frogs and logs. <laughs> and, or just, you Plop. know, recognizable little cliched stuff. And, you know, one's background gets in there, and this is what you've got to pay attention to. 
Well, let's uh, end this little segment and listen to uh, a poem by Don and maybe a, another person uh, from the poetry group. And when we get back, we'll talk a little bit. Jen Hannell, Poppy. Great farce, this false nativity, absent Christ. That girl up the street, shrouded, a vaudeville virgin, trapped in the limbs of charlatan magi, bearing gifts, the stillborn. Her eyes wet mush, her feet half cremated. They should finish her off. She'd take up less space in that cup she's holding. And we're back talking with Don Moss and Robert Newkirk. Robert, you had something to say about the process of writing or getting started, I think? Um, I, I just thought earlier when some people were talking about uh, how, how they had gotten started X number of years ago and whatnot, uh, and it made me recall uh, my own experience. I think it's not unusual for, for people to start writing poetry uh, when they're teenagers. <clears throat> and uh, Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't so often outlast the teenage years, but anyway, I was beginning high school when I started poetry, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't really remember, um, you know, what I learned in in English literature class, but I do recall, uh, for some reason, after I had gotten interested in writing myself, I got a paperback version of uh, an anthology by this person. Uh, I think his name is uh, Louis Untermeyer. Yeah. yeah, he did who, several anthologies. He himself was a, a poet right. who never quite made it big yeah. time, but his anthology, I thought, was very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, it's one of the classics from the early 20th century. Yeah, it's full well, of good stuff. just a minute, yeah. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been reprinted numerous times. I, I, yeah. I read it uh, in the early 60s. Okay. And uh, yeah, a little paperback condensed version. But it, it had uh, you know a short biographical introduction, which I found useful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can remember, like, that was my introduction to, to people that weren't talked about in class. Like, I, I can remember reading Prufrock, Prufrock there yeah. uh, and, and thinking, wow, this is a, actually an interesting poem. And mm -hmm. here I am, like 15 years old, reading about the uh, uh, middle age angst, <laughs> but getting something out of it, right. on the surface anyway. And, uh, I really uh, have a sentimental attachment to, to that anthology, and if I find it, in, if anyone finds it in a bookstore, call me up. I want to buy it, <laughs> because my original version was long since last. Well, lost. something you just said is interesting, because uh, Jessica, I, I, re I just, this weekend I'm going to be putting up an essay on uh, Stephen King's book on writing, and I, Jessica had really liked the book, and I don't think it's really worth much, but it's interesting, it got me thinking. Uh, I've always thought that in order to be at least a good, competent writer, you have to learn all the rules of grammar and all the basic, you know, workshoppy kind of things. But in order to be a very good or a great writer, to move beyond, you have to consciously unlearn those things because the, the art, I mean, you have to learn how to paint inside the frame before you can move outside the frame in whatever endeavor you're going to do. I don't think a lot of writers understand that because a lot of times, you know, you'll get young writers who think, well, I'm going to do the first thought, best thought, beatnik thing. And they write, blah, 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 blah crap, crap, crap. I did, blah, blah, you know, you know, sitting in a cafe. And it's a you journal know, but, entry. Yeah, and it's a journal entry. And they say, well, I don't have to follow any rules or whatnot, you know. And they'll take someone, they say, well, Whitman didn't do that. Right. Or this one didn't do that. But it's not Whitman that they're doing. And and if you look, if you look, for example, at really good poems of a Whitman or a Baudelaire or any great poet that you can name, all of their poems, despite what they might say, follow certain dictates. They'll have strong images, they'll have memorable lines, and even if, if the political view of that person says, well, you know, if it's like some postmodernist or some abstract, that we're, we're gonna kill beauty or we're gonna kill this, the stuff that, rem that, that stays is actually stuff that is beautiful, that has a mnemonic structure that, that sticks in people's mind despite their attempts to... Yeah, and it's a memorable experience reading a poem like that. What yeah. you're saying makes me remember um, one, of the, one of the short poems in, uh, in the anthology mm -hmm. that I was just speaking about. And uh, it, it could be that one of my strongest early influences, not that I like to talk about the subject, but maybe one of the strongest was... Uh, a famous poet called Anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, I just was sitting here listening to you and trying to remember the four lines. Maybe I've got them. I, I hope I haven't misquoted them. Uh, anyway, it, it, this is an example of a poem that influenced me. Uh, o western wind, wind wilt thou blow, that the small rain down may rain. 
Christ that my love were in my arms and I in my bed again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Middle English, actually. So yeah. Yeah. that, that yeah. was one of my uh, Untermeyer uh, yeah. influences. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm trying to that. I, I, that sound it sounds like a John Donne line, but I don't think it. it I don't think it is done. No, that's no. like 12th century, I think, isn't it? Yeah, something or yeah. earlier. It's very now. Early. Before before we uh, bring yeah. uh, talk to Donnie, I just want to ask you now that you you read that poem, but you don't. We're not going to hear a poem from you tonight. I know you're often shy about reading your poems, and you don't. I know you oftentimes when I wanted copies of your poems to put online, you're you're hesitant. What is that still part of that teenage insecurity that that you haven't gotten over yet? That you don't want your poems people looking anonymously online and saying that guy sucks. You know, I, I, I suppose there's some anxiety there of that nature, but um, at least on the surface, I, I have my, uh, I, I have a different take on it. Um, I, I'm a, sort of an obsessive reviser. And one of the things that I, I end up uh, regretting sometimes is, is showing early versions. Oh, like like yeah. I said earlier, I, I have some, you know, I brought some poems that were 12, 15 years old to the, to the group. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with that long distance. You can look at this poem in, in a way that you never could mm -hmm. early on. Mm -hmm. Far more objectively? Far more objectively. Okay. You can see its weaknesses. But even so, I'm attached to some parts of it. Otherwise, you know, right. I wouldn't have even brought it. Right. So then, you know, people hit on some part of it. And then I have to go through it all again. And anyway, eventually I end up with a poem which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really satisfied with, but I'm kind of happy that the early one isn't out there, the early version. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I am kind of hoping to collect something and, and make a, a little chapbook or something. Well, let, show me it first so that I can, you know, so give you can some jump advice. On it, right? But now, <laughs> both, now it cost me another ten years yeah. of revision. <laughs> but just, now, now both Don and, and Robert, you were both like in your mid fifties. But unlike unlike Robert, who apparently started young, did Don? You came to poetry late, like in your forties. Mm, well, barely starting. Uh, first marriage, English major. She was masters. Uh, she got her master's in it, uh, William and Mary, when I was finishing undergrad in philosophy. And uh, one of the books that she had around was just some dreadful, here's poetry sort of thing. But, you know, it was back when schools didn't teach sociology in every class. I mean, you know, there's some pretty good poems in it, and it, it was a good anthology of American and British. Mm -hmm. And I read through that. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm finishing my undergraduate degree, not taking literature classes, not writing poetry. And uh, I, I discovered poems were starting to work their way into essays, like 20 page essays mm -hmm. or something. You know, one was on the, the one more or less book on Christianity, uh, or rather, class on Christianity that I took. Um, and, you know, it was William and Mary, so the guy teaching it, of course, was also the author of the text. I mean, you know, it was, it was an okay school. But, you know, out from there, um, I think I, I, for a long time, had an argument with philosophy, like, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to stop this and I'm supposed to turn to literature. And, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I was reading, you know, sort of the, the you know, the Pomo version right. of that and, yeah. and the modern version. But, right. I mean, you know, I, I looked at Ashbury, I looked at O'Hara, and, you know, people who had their own little fights with this sort of thing. I guess, what, Ashbury is ABD, is he not? Something like that. Yeah, something mm -hmm. like that. Lots of the Academy. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, of course, you know, thought, well, I'm supposed to read Keats and I'm supposed to read this and that, you know, and I would. But, um, you know, your your love of rewriting famous poems, Dan, you know, I, I you know, I, I love a, a number of things by Shakespeare, but there's hardly anything that I don't want to rewrite, uh -huh. you know, because... <laughs> Actually, that's interesting. I've run into that myself. I have a series of poems I call Portraits, mm -hmm. which are basically character studies, but they're all fictional characters. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite of them is actually the heroine of one of my favorite comic books mm -hmm. from like 15, 20 years ago. Ah. So that, I, think that, I think that urge to rewrite is, is responsive in a way that's, that's creative. It's almost like, here's the mirror, but, but I can do this better, or I found an insight into this person that maybe the original writer missed, or... Well, yeah, well, I mean, I, I... Did not intend at all. A number know. of times, even before I started doing my This Old Poem series, which is basically essays where I take poems by famous poets and I make them better, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll say, every poem that I've done, I'll, I'll state, is a better poem. You can argue maybe with a few here or there, but they're better. And yet people will come and... 
uh, Jess, you might remember like a couple of years ago before I even started doing that that essay, when I wrote some criticism, people will say, well, Yates is an immortal. You can't say that, you know, Yates wrote a bad poem. And there was a woman that I wanted to have on the show called Kate Benedict, who has a, a website. Uh, uh, if you Google the name Kate Benedict, she's actually one of the few online poets that writes good, solid, competent poems. And she had a Yates poem that was a four line poem. And it, it, it was, I, I forget what it was, uh, but it's just really horrible poem. And I mean, you know, great poets have written shit. I mean, if you look at if you look at the 154 sonnets of Shakespeare, I think there are maybe eight or ten, maybe twelve great sonnets, and a real Shakespeare file could argue for maybe twice as many being great. But there's a lot of garbage, a lot of peanut butter, tongue twistery poems that just sputter. And just because it's Shakespeare doesn't mean it's good. And yet people have this thing, and I think it's because you get a certain imprimatur that this person is published or this person has been read here. Well, it's not even so much the published as, as, as the fame thing. I mean, there's plenty of people who find James Joyce unreadable, but he's supposed to be great because people say he is. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I happen to have read Finnegan's Wake, and I think it's brilliant, but I also know that there's a trick to it that, that it seems like everybody eludes. And that's you have to read it out loud in an Irish accent, and then it all works perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it makes total sense. Well, Don, the, well, back to yeah, this, yeah. this argument of, of finding poets that I could deal with. I mean, no surprise, looking at a number of modern, particularly Americans, you get into free verse. And, you know, this seemed to be interesting for a while. But then I noticed that, of course, people I was looking at really had an earlier career writing more formal poetry. Hmm. And, you know, you, you I don't know, I, I really look at going at least reasonably formal is just simply maturing you know you're taking poetry on its own terms and i mean we can argue about this forever but so much of free verse is junk mm -hmm. and well, some of it is prose rearranged on the page sure sure and you know talking about the name cell right and yeah that, exactly that's, that's it but i mean if you just keep writing these you know quaint little quaint whatever shocking little arrangements of words and you never pay any attention to meter and you never think of rhyme because you you know that's kind of like bourgeois or something but i mean you know after a while you've just got to grow up and try to do the task of poetry yeah. and then if you want to come out of that i think you've got a kind of maturity that you don't get if you just say oh i'm modern i gotta you know not well you got you yeah, to stuff. me it, it's the subject matter i've written sonnets i've written free verse poems i've written 14 15 page poems i've written occasionally some haiku uh to me it's what the subject matter entails sometimes you know whether I, if i'm writing about you know ma barco or if uh, i'm writing about some fictional astronaut a hundred years from now or if i'm writing from the point of view of a flea it, it, whatever whatever at that moment congeals that's what you go with i i've never been one to think that well you have to do free verse you have to do formal verse i mean you have bad free verse poets like a donald hall he's the modern eugene field even though eugene field wrote terrible quatrains 120 years ago i mean they both wrote bad poetry and they were both bad at their particular uh, genre if you will or, 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 or uh, style but, you know, I just want to end this segment, Don. You know, I know you generally uh, detest confessionalism, yet in your long poem, Dominions, it's basically told from the point of view of a poem that most people would probably ostensibly take as being you. Yet it's different than most confessional poems in that there isn't the sort of mawkishness, there isn't the, the sort of ego, sentimentality, the ego yeah. gratification. And I'm just wondering, uh, is that just, did that naturally outflow from your being, or was that a conscious choice on your? Uh, well, I mean, I, I was certainly reading my share of James Merrill at the time, someone who can make a story about himself mm -hmm. and do that. I mean, I think when I was writing particularly the, the first half of that, I was reading Merrill. I was reading still a little bit of O'Hara. I mean, in particular, lots of other people, too. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just a big mix like that of people who do know how to tell a story that there's a character like themselves in it but the poem goes where it needs to go. Well, uh, we're going to wrap up this segment and uh, we're going to listen to some more poems. And I want to thank both Robert Newkirk and Don Moss for sitting in. Uh, and when we come back from listening to a few poems, we'll have uh, some other Twin Cities poets who have occasionally come to the Uptown Poetry Group, but uh, are poets in their own right, unaffiliated, free agents. So let's listen to some more poems. Yay. <laughs> Dylan Garcia Wall, 
the fifth season. A fifth season could be made of this hollowness, brought upon by parched temptation, which falls to disfavored wish. A moratorium on reason, bitter wines are bettered to conscience in this unattainable night that harkens back with regrets to winter and begs the coming of spring. Alone within the choking flame of candles on a night too haughty for shadows. On pillows carved of sweet indifference, a fifth season could be made of the closing of my eyes. Only the ability to have desire is more frightening than the denial of desire. Poem number two. Unassailable is her placement to dreams. The silhouette she holds against dusk it is a wine delight cannot abandon. Here, were there anything forbidden, it would vanish more rapidly than does the sun linger at the horizon. Were there anything forbidden, what would she be to dreams? No. Unlike the tradition of sunset, she, never to bend, sipped over lilac bushes, complementing their scent with hers. All right, we're uh, we're here uh, uh, talking with two other poets uh, who I've known around the Twin Cities area, Dylan Garcia Wall and Sindra Halm, and I've known both of them for about a decade. Um, uh, both I, I, Sindra, I believe, I met in late '93. She was teaching some classes at a Borders or a Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. and Dylan, I met at a coffee house he always says yeah, Susan's, Susan's coffee, coffee house, house. Mm -hmm. uh, which is now defunct but it's prairie uh, star now well it's now another coffee yeah. house <laughs> but uh, both of them uh, Cinder came about two or three times to the Uptown Poetry Group uh, in the early years and uh, Dylan has come I don't know maybe seven eight ten times something like that over the, the over the 200 meetings and both of them uh, recently have chapbooks so during the course of the show we'll hear some of their poetry um, let's go with ladies first uh, where is your chapbook being published and what is the name of it and how many poems, etc. Uh, my chapbook is called Inflectional Weather, and it's published by uh, Press of the Taverner here in the Twin Cities. Mm. Uh, publisher Alan De Niro, who is a colleague of mine at the Loft, and has a um, has had a website for a number of years called Taverners Cohen's. Uh, which is an online poetry workshop and resource center with writing exercises, uh, discussions of poems, and chat rooms. So this is a kind of an offshoot of that. He's also published some fiction chapbooks under hmm. a different imprint. Okay. So now you had done a, a series of poems a couple of years ago regarding women, and they would use the same line, I believe, or the same image in each poem. Was that the? Yeah, it, those aren't in here. No. <laughs> no. What, what is the? What is this? Uh, um, this takes what? a little bit more of an experimental bent, and um, uh, by that okay. I guess I mean. Um, um, it, it, I, I'm interested. Uh, I'm interested in a lot of different things. The women poems in their same or similar line was one aspect, and I do have some poems that are in series, as, as that one is, but I'm also interested in the way words sound harmoniously, inharmoniously, uh, the way they clash and collide. Um, I often hear words and sounds and inflections first, and um, the musicality, the muscularity, of the poem interests me. So the poems in this chapbook are more in that vein. Earlier we had uh, Jen Hanlon, and I know she had uh, talked about the. I think she, it was it Sassy or the Loft that she had mentioned. I the know. Loft. I know one of the one of the things, and this is one of the things we've disagreed over mm -hmm. the years. Is I don't have a. You must have a cast iron stomach because <laughs> I really can't take. And it's not just the Loft or Sassy, but uh, the West West Side Y in New York that I had gone to in the late eighties, early nineties too. How do you, how, I mean, you're a good, good poet and, you know, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've stated that before that it's, it's not, you know, because I know you personally that I'm saying that one of the reasons I like you and, and have, have sought out your intellectual company at times is because you are a good poet. How, how do you go to some of these things where you know that there are people who have no talent and they come sort of groveling to you and they look up to you as the Buddha? How do you, how do you, how, how do you deal with that and, how do you let them down or have you ever had when if you've ever let someone down do you get have you had recriminations because I can't believe that no one's ever you, you've never had that situation do you mean my students, students. I teach at the loft yeah. okay okay well um, 
I guess in my teacher role, I do believe that there are developmental aspects of learning and art. And so all I can do in the classroom is try to facilitate that um, by giving what I think is information and inspiration. Do and you, so, do you do you see something in some students and push them in that direction sometimes? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I try to I try to see what is the best aspect in any poem and try to encourage okay. encourage that. And some people are ready to hear things, and you know, at a certain time, other people aren't. And who knows why someone's taking a class? It's not for me to say. Hmm. But why, you, why they're taking it. All I can do is say what I think. Have you ever uh, had the bravery uh, to discourage someone? That's not my place. That's no. not my place as a teacher. Mm -mm. They're, they're coming to a class to, um, to write, and, and I want to encourage that in whatever way. If somebody's coming to me one-on-one -on -one for a manuscript review, for mm -hmm. example, then I will give a little bit more... Um, uh, information and inspiration on a on a uh, on a more personal basis and in a way that I that might be a little tougher criticism than mm -hmm. one might get in a classroom mm -hmm. of especially when I teach beginner classes it's I don't feel it's my place to discourage people in those situations mm -hmm. I try to find what they're getting and try to encourage that aspect. Well, I know that uh, I said you, you'd come maybe two or three times to the poetry group. I know you said you had had an all-women's poetry group for a, a while. Um, when, you, when you write poems, where do you get feedback? I mean, I, I know uh, uh, your, your guy Barry isn't a poet, uh, and so, I mean, is there someone you bounce ideas off? Well, why haven't you come to the Uptown Poetry Group more often? <laughs> the real question emerges <laughs> after a decade. <laughs> oh. But, I mean, seriously, where, where do you, I mean, you, you, you're talking about the role of the teacher, but, right. I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, who do you bounce ideas off of if you don't have a regular group, or do you? Um, I do, and it's changed over the years, and I have several people that I check in with once in a while depending on what I'm writing and 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 what I need um, but I think at its best the mature groups um, are both support groups and critique groups and that is you support the human effort toward making art and then you look closely at the individual poem or whatever piece of art at hand and give your opinion and I agree with some of the other comments that you know you learn to develop your internal voice and you don't always take whatever criticisms given but you listen with an open mind and try to determine uh, how to make the poem in whatever way better or at least understand how readers might perceive it. Okay, let's let's ask Dylan because Dylan's come a few more times than Sindra. But uh, why haven't you come more to a group, whether it's the Uptown Poetry Group or have you gone to any other groups as well? My time's very uh, limited. Who do you um, bounce ideas off of or poetry things? Because uh, I know uh, people I respect, uh, people that I can uh, show them uh, a poem, and whether they like it or not, I know I'm going to get back good criticism and. N or what I believe to be knowledgeable criticism mm -hmm. and honest and honest. And honest oh, it has to be honest. Yeah. I, I don't. Uh, yeah, I can uh, because I can. I can find twenty people that I can give it to that no matter what it is, they're going to tell me it's good. Right. Okay. But that doesn't help me. Well, that's. I guess that's my point all along. Is is that honest criticism is the only thing that can help you as a writer. Yeah. I mean, you know that those twenty people who tell you it's good are not helping you grow. Yeah. As a writer. Well, yeah, honest criticism, but it also has to be some sort of knowledgeable criticism. I mean, if someone, you know, just you know, throws it back to me and says that's crap, that right. that does me no good. Yeah, that's true. And if they can't explain to me why that's crap, that does me no good either. Or why this line works and this line doesn't. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, well, de detail is important. I mean, you yeah. have to be able to. I mean. I know a lot of times when Don uh, came regularly to the group, a lot of times he would get that because, as he said, his his poetry is much more dense and you know he, it's much more knowledgeable than a lot of beginners might be used to. And he'd often get that kind of criticism. Well, I don't understand that, yeah. but that's not really. Uh, I mean, no. you there there, are, there is un, uh, there is abstruse poetry that's very good and abstruse poetry that's just abstruse for abstruseness's sake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in 1994. I, I read at a coffee shop uh, one time, and uh, a gentleman stu um, just stood up in the crowd and said, that's crap, and I asked him why. And I was very interested in what, sure. would, what would drive someone to sure. stand up in a crowd and say, that's crap. Right. And he goes, well, it didn't make sense. I said, 
but why didn't it make sense? Did you just not understand it? Therefore, any anything you don't understand is crap. And he turned white and ran out. You know, what was he supposed to take? You from put him on the spot, and he couldn't answer. Then, really, in some ways, I mean, yeah. Now, like Sindra, okay. you uh, have a book of poetry coming out, and you yeah. had a, a, a novel that came out a couple of months ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ashes of Mid Autumn is the poetry book also at the same publisher. What's its name? What's yeah, its thrust? Uh, and what? PA publisher who's out of New York, Baltimore, Amsterdam. Uh, they're publishing. They don't publish poetry, um, but uh, they. Uh, this is one of their first collections that they've ever published. Hmm. Uh, so is it a chapbook or? A oh regular? no, no, it's a couple hundred pages long. Hmm. Um, it's a bit of a collection of uh, poetry. Uh, just let me weed out my closet a bit from 1990. I think the earliest poem in there is one or two poems from 94 up to the present. Mm, okay. Uh, then um, the so it's like eight year. It's an eight year collection. Um, mm-hmm. The poems I've written over the last eight months. Um, we're looking at the big boys in New York to come out with that uh, early next year. Uh, so I went from eight years to eight months, and now you know my next collection will be eight days. Say the <laughs> name of the publisher again. A uh, PA Publishing. PA. Mm-hmm. PA Publishing. Yeah. Now I know Dylan because uh, you. Uh, All that does come of Matt and Days. Okay. Get the title on there. All of, uh, early it was mentioned. Uh, Jen Hanlon mentioned balls, and I know you had read a yeah. couple of times of balls, and I yeah. know when you when you've read you you have a, 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 a I guess. A, say an affected reading style and that you part of your your presentation of, of, of reading you know is is uh your style of reading is as important in the reading performance as as the words to a degree i'm wondering is that something that you consciously came about at an early early time a decision or is that something that you just found worked better that got a better response from the crowd or what no, I, I don't think I really thought about it at all. I know when I met you, Dan, back in 93, uh, the first few times I read to an audience, I, I audio taped it so I could hear it back to hear what I, I was doing. I remember it a couple of times, yeah. Yeah, because I wanted to hear what I was doing, because you can't do that when you're up there. Right, yeah. Or maybe now I can, but back then, yeah, it, it wasn't a chance. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't know. I, I get up and I read it. I, I'm not putting on a performance per se. I read uh, one time at Sirsum Corda uh, for a CD release party of poetry uh, Words Will Heal the Wound or something along those lines. And um, I read um, uh, uh, several pieces that fit to Rachmaninoff's Isle of the Dead. Mm. Now that was performance uh, because I was actually going to straight towards the music and the music was influencing how I was reading that, but that's the only But you time. were very influenced by beatnik poetry when I first oh, met you. yeah, early on. Yeah, I disregard that now. <laughs> how about you, Cinder? I know that uh, when I've seen you read in public that you, I, you take on a stance. I mean, your body language changes. You, you get more, you are the poet mm. rather than just Cinder. Mm. And... Uh, as I asked him, uh, is that something that just evolved naturally out of reading over the course of months or years, or is that something that was early on you said, I'm going to do it this way? I think it evolved. I um, uh, In college, I was uh, an actor in some plays, and I've been a dancer on stage. And I think um, a certain amount of stage presence and a certain amount of vocal presence um, just enhances the uh, mm-hmm. reading of poetry. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't consider my work performance poetry either. Not specifically um, performance poetry. No, okay. no. I, I'm not looking to uh, inflect the words with greater meaning through my yeah. performance. Uh, rather, I'm trying to enunciate and give some inflection to a greater m- meaning for the poem itself. The so. interesting thing about that is, is I'm, I'm intrigued that the actor's craft is part of that because mm-hmm, sure. I have been to numerous readings of poems of, of poems by poets who I have read in print and I've liked their work and they absolutely kill it when they read it out loud because mo- most poets sit there staring at the paper not at the, no contact with the audience mm. and they read in a single monotone and every line is just the same and there's no inflection no matter what they're doing 
a and vo- that kills it. Yeah, a vocal verbal experience is a lot different than a than than an word. experience on the page. Sure, right. one's for the eye, one's for the ear. Exactly. The bo- the bo- I think I, there was yeah. an anthology called Poetry Speaks that Jessica and I, we've got the three oh. CDs of, and you yeah. can hear like uh, Yates and Tennyson when they were reading, they read in that old affected mm-hmm. kind of style. Yeah. And now, right. when the oh, right. oh, right. you know, it's what sort of like a, yeah. this Cherokee Stylistic. chant. Stylistic, yeah. yeah. It's what a style. Sandra, I mean, I was in the theater for uh, a right. lot of my youth, and I think, you know, um, just naturally ingrained is projection. Sure. Um, certain enunciation. You know, an, enunciation. All delivery. That. But, delivery. But, yeah. like, right. but um, Dan and I saw uh, uh, Stephen Mitchell, uh, who. Right. Or Stephen Mitchell. Stephen Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. I was, yeah. uh, we <laughs> saw him read A Hungry Mind and. Uh, his translations or his own work? His translations oh. of, uh, of Real Cat. And mm-hmm. just, you, you completely blew my translations of Real Cat because. He read Apollo's torso, and he's very effeminate in New York, and so he's reading Apollo's torso, and he ends up with, you must change your life. (laughs) That's not how to read that line. It's always interesting when you read something and your imagination takes over the the vocal inflection. I had an experience early on where I was so excited to hear Gary Snyder read in the the 80s, actually, because I loved Turtle Island at Mm. that time, and he came, and when he opened his mouth, I was just in shock. That's not how it's supposed to be read. Mm. Well, do, I, I? do I have to say he's gotten better? <laughs> he has gotten better. I, had, oh, I, good, saw, him, I saw him read in Berkeley about three years ago, and he actually did pretty good. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear so, that. Yeah. Well, actually, a poet that I always rip is a local university professor named Michael Dennis Brown. He was a terrible, terrible poet himself. Except but for his first book. Read his first book. I, I have his first yeah. book. Well, you're, Wife you're, in you're winter? a good person. You're a good person. <laughs> no, no, so. I, I, I like that one. I honestly like that one. But he's a terrific reader, and the first time I actually saw him, he, he does a Christmas. Series where he reads poems at Christmas time of the year. He's he's one of those people that I guess comes out of that Shakespearean tradition, and he 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 really can uh, can can hit hit poems. I'm trying to think of some other poets, uh, famous poets I might have heard uh, over the years, and who was good and who was bad. I know probably the, the most ridiculous performance that I ever saw. I went to the West Side Y in the late '80s and I, to hear Amiri Baraka, mm-hmm. and Amiri Baraka came out. And he didn't read. He came out with like eight or nine college, white college acolytes. They came and they surrounded him and they said that there had been some offense that he took at. And so <laughs> Baraka sat there, some white college girl read his poems. And then after two poems, they just left. It was one of the most bizarre readings I've ever been to. But it just goes to show you the, the, the lengths that people you know, go to. Can go I ahead. make a comment? There's I some Jessica. Also, um, important part is the poet's voice because I love the way Robert Frost reads but I mm. don't like his voice it's very yeah. scratchy but I mm. but I love Stevens mm. voice but he's almost too slow and do, yeah. do you Wallace Stevens imitation he's like now the woman walks on the shore yeah he has that he has that, <laughs> that, that yeah. Yeah. and Wallace I mean, Stevens is a, I mean seriously <laughs> listening to sleep. it yeah basically <laughs> right. but he's got a nice sounding voice he just needs to pick it up more for the page. Well, we, ha- we hadn't asked anyone um, what, what poets, and I'll, I'll, we've got the other people here, uh, we'll, we'll go around and ask them uh, too a little bit, but uh, Sindra, name like three or four poets that you think are really great poets, poets that, ha- you know, guided you, uh, you know, started Constellations you writing. Constellations in your firmament, as oh it were. Oh my goodness, yeah. exactly. Uh, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Yeah. I think yeah. on my feet. Uh, Hopkins, an early, okay. uh, because of the vocal, the sprung the music. rhythm, the musicality, yeah, yeah, the muscularity, mm-hmm. absolutely. Cummings, absolutely. Okay. Plath, absolutely. Uh, well, see, Plath, I think, is a good example. And one of these days, I'm going to do an essay on her and Hart Crane, because I think they are true language poets. I much do, more too. So, she's much not more, a confessional yeah. poet, in my opinion. She's the first language well, poet. She did write confessionals, but her yeah. greatness is the way she uses language. The way she, she wrote confessionals. She, she can she, t- no. turn on an emotion at, at an end line, and that, that's what made her a great poet. Yeah. Or Hart Crane is like that, too. Um, or, or are there any others? Uh, contemporary poets, uh, Heather McHugh, a big favorite of mine hmm. for okay. her for her intellectual... Um, arguments, if you will, and wordplay, and um, she's also one of the few poets contemporary that has even a dram of humor. She's fabulous. Yeah, yeah, she's a good teacher. That's that's one of the things I think that's missing from contemporary poetry. Yes, it's so humor. serious. Yeah. There's no there's no humor. I mean, well, you know, life is a serious thing. I mean, <laughs> g- g- give me Edward Lear over Donald yeah. Hall any day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dylan, how about you? Um, like we touched on earlier, I mean, uh, I started in Ginsburg thinking that, you know, he walked on water and how wrong I was. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was... He was Things change through early, time. Yes, they do. I grew, I, I grew up. 
But uh, no, I mean, early Ginsburg's very good. Howell, Kaddish, uh, Fall of America. So mm-hmm. wonderful. Anything after Fall of America is BS. Um, I mean, his last hepatitis body itch crap. Um, but uh, no, but otherwise, the people that I turn to or that help most, uh, Rilke, uh, John Dunn especially, mm-hmm. did okay. a lot for me. Uh, and I, I, friend, I'm the one who told Dan you. Dan Schneider, uh, Jessica Schneider. No. <laughs> Yes, Dan, Dan came up to me one day in a coffee house and uh, said, Oh, you must love John Dunn. You write, I, I see John Dunn in your writing, and I, and at that time, had not read John Dunn because I was not interested in the English yeah. poets at the time. Yeah. I was very 19th century How about French George poetry. Herbert? Now, but not back then. Okay. I yeah. mean, this is 1993. Yeah, okay. And uh, he, he bought me my first John Dunn collection, and I, I called him probably every day for six months saying, I don't get it. I, I, I understood Dunn. I didn't see the comparison. And then finally one day I go, now I see what you're pointing at. All yeah, right. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, just before, before uh, Don, you had mentioned that you had been reading uh, Frank O'Hara and uh, James Merrill and John Ashbery. Would you consider those poets that uh, are, you know, influences or poets that you go back to? Oh, neck and neck with Raymond Carver. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm serious. Really? Yeah, because he can tell a story. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's, that's how he instructs. And Jess, I know we, we mentioned uh, Sexton. How, I'm it, not so much Sexton because she gets really sloppy. I mean, I think the best of Sexton transcends the confessionalism. Yeah. Well, Sexton, you know? at the and, end, was trying so hard to be plath that she yeah. was failing in her own voice. Robert, uh, one or two poets that uh, have influenced you? Well, you mentioned earlier, just a minute ago, John Donne. John Donne? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I, to, to me, I... Th- if I read like the Holy Sonnets, which there's only about sixteen or twenty of them, yeah. I, 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 there's maybe two or three that are mediocre. But I think he's a, a much better sonneteer than Shakespeare. Oh. He's much more lucid, and and where I mean, Not don't get me wrong, I love the best of Shakespeare. He wrote a dozen or so great poems, uh, plays, and uh, you know uh, some great sonnets. But it, it, I, I just don't understand sometimes why some some poets get or some artists get. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's because he got popular recognition through his plays that sure. that people uh, did with Dun, Dun, Dun didn't. But anyway, let's uh, take a break and uh, listen to some more uh, poems from some uh, Uptown Poetry Group members and uh, Cinder and Dylan. And when we get back, we'll talk a little bit more and wrap up the show with uh, Cinder Helm and Dylan. Don Moss, Southern Boyhood. The boy retread his old dominions, first vulcanized by a cantilevered beach boy guitar. One forgets love that new template less tangible than dream tailings. War relics between the states disinter, dirt caked rounds from whopping half-inch boars. What great hole makers behind which to peep at that secret of wanting to wish all one was near away. What should one feel after a hole that size attaches itself? While this business whispers in sleigh patois, good-yeared Chevys on the county road break for hairpins of southern hospitality and retired coast on annuity. Uh, Davidson's eighth psalm, which I'll gloss Donald H. Davidson is a very well-known, recently deceased American philosopher. Many would say a good state for most any philosopher. Assurance that all of life was billeted to earth shines around the wrist in gold, its chains running to posts below the curve, as well as prove the story we are told. I was raised to bow to the truth of that and, less, feel the stomach ache of science. What if I was born in Bombay? My tenth year mind had reasoned and has mumbled since. Such reason deduced I'd be pure, quote, Bombayan, hugged and whipped by beings with many arms. So where's the relativity in that? fearing its goodness, consuming its charm. I read that one bacterium on Mars may sort all deities with Monday's trash. Mono gods stood in gods of methane gas, golden calves melted into coins for cash. I hate 
how I can't say what I don't believe, a friend quaked. So why covet just to lack? And, and isn't that number five of the Big Ten? Seven and ten, neighbor's wife in the rack. So it is, and she is co-creator. But what is found in one atom germ? What is prophesied of non-crossing lines? How completely these questions I have learned answer out in refracted paraphrase about a god who does not go away, yet is cast to play the silent vagrant. Quick shots, stereotyped, health and decay. Now, decay, it seems, is not quick enough. A federal judge orders that the ten laws be removed despite protestation, charging their presence the greater sin. What confident Jehovah needs to prove a thing more or leave a forwarding address? The greatest test he gives is his absence, leaving us to spin our proofs without rest. But my Greek mind must have been sleeping, my neck sore from searching between the stars. Hadn't Aristotle said form dwells in things and the sky, both as far and close as Mars? All right, we're back, uh, wrapping up uh, this episode of Omniversica. Uh, we've had uh, four members of the Uptown Poetry Group, and we're now talking with Sindra Helm and Dylan Garcia Wall. And in the break, we're just talking about uh, poets that you dislike, and uh, I was asked uh, to name poets I dislike, and really, I mean, you know, too numerous to mention. Yeah, I mean, you just have to go with those those that are good because I mean, you know, you can look on Cosmoetica and I mean, I, I named the. I mean, if I talk about the absolute scraping the bottom of the barrel, I mean, as far as name poets that have made it into major anthologies, a, a Donald Hall is horrendous. I mean, he, what does everyone think of uh, our current poet laureate? Billy oh, Collins. I, I try not to. Um. Yeah, Collins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Collins, yeah, Collins is someone who, if he had some humor, could be an Edward Lear, but I, there's just nothing there. I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't go into depths of the horrendous stuff we've had for poet laureates, but it just doesn't go anywhere. I want to marry Baraka for the poet laureate yeah. for the U.S. You know, <laughs> we can, we can, we can uh, start another uh, Yom Kippur war if we had it, him as a poet. It's not happening. <laughs> but I mean, for the longest time, Dan would challenge people. You know, if you can name who you like name who you don't like and I think Dan even came to the point of saying well, where do you stop yeah I mean uh, if I think I mean she had mentioned like a Heather McHugh and Heather McHugh is a pretty uh, good poet another one is Patty Ann Rogers who mm -hmm. wrote some good science poems but again one of the things I've often found is poets get repetitious Patty Ann Rogers first few books were very good but she sort of has now poems that have a long kind of funky title and she repeats herself and you can see that she hasn't moved beyond that and I've always thought that Poets sort of hit their stride in general around 35 to 50. That's their their frame. The only poets that come to mind that were really great poets uh, uh, that went beyond 50 that I can think of would be Yeats and Stevens, who got better as they got older. Most of the yeah. other poets pretty much, uh, you know, tailed off after they hit uh, 50 or so. I don't know. Is there anyone that comes to Those mind to you? To Art? I'm thinking. Of, I'm trying to think of somebody. Oh, Gwendolyn Brooks. Gwendolyn Brooks. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, she she really tailed off, and that that's I think because she became political. I mean, her early stuff she wasn't Great. consciously trying to be a black yeah. poet, and then when she got th and her, her stuff was tight and detailed, and then she got free verse and she got jiggy, and when she got mm -hmm. jiggy, it went in the crapper. Um, One of my favorite poets who hardly anybody knows about is uh, is George McKay Brown, who spent most of his life in the Orkney Islands off the shore of Northern Scotland. And I thought he got better as he got older. And he died in his 70s, just about, I don't know, six years ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he often repeated some of his same themes, but everything got tighter and more musical as time went by. So, you know, a, a poem he wrote about the 12 days of Christmas 50 years ago, you said it next to when he wrote about the 12 days of Christmas 12 years ago, the one from 12 years ago, is amazing. 
just amazing. And we mentioned Plath. I mean, Plath certainly. I think she improved. She improved, yeah. you know, up to the. But she ending, he also you know. cut herself short, though. Too. Well, yeah, so. it's the same with Rimbaud. Obviously, he got better. You know, yeah, ended ended with a burst, but then he you know stopped writing for the right. second. Well, I, part of his I would life. I would disagree with that. I think Rimbaud had had some talent. I don't think he ever put it together. I think Bo yeah, is a far superior opponent. So oh, is Yeah, but you'd have to admit that you know Season of Hell's better than his earliest stuff. Yeah, but I mean, th- well, that's that's an interesting thing. You know, we talked about uh, Emily Dickinson and Sylvia Plath and Anne Saxon as being sort of the trinity of, of female poets. I think young male poets that I've met, uh, the the trinity is sort of John Keats, Rimbaud, or Rambo, however you want to pronounce his name, and then somehow Jim Morrison sneaks yeah. in. Yeah, Jim <laughs> Morrison right. always comes in. <laughs> he always gets But in. that that's that's sort of the the, the three on either side. Well, of emphasis this on the word divide. teenage, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, these are the three poets that that everyone discovers in their teens, yeah. and and their anger you know connects to their lives mm-hmm. which is why you often run into a lot of bad teenage poetry that's journal entry you know mm-hmm. plath or rambo yeah. i see a lot of i see a lot of I don't know, call it goth poetry, which is trying to be shocking. And I'm like, you know, Alice Cooper did that 30 years ago. Right, and and, and shock poetry <laughs> ha- it has a very short shelf, and shock art has a short shelf life, whether it's, uh, you know, I, I did the essay on the Stephen I mean, Pinker book. The you thing know, is, is so much slam price. crap falls into that too, trying to shock to get that. But, that the, but the thing is, is I mean, I, I've, I've, I've heard performances of Baudelaire's, like, you know, uh, the poem The Gibbet, which can still be shocking. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell uh, you something. I don't something. know why, but it is. To me, the great divide between the spoken and the written word. I, I don't think Dylan was there, but he knows a fellow, there's a fellow named Eric Bailey, who's a, a poet uh, in the yeah, Twin Cities. Oh, yeah, he's a young black fellow who is an okay writer. I think he has some talent. I don't know if he's ever going to make it, but he read one uh, long 14, 15 page poem one time out of a poetry reading that I was hosting from Bob Kaufman. Now, Kaufman was a Jewish black beatnik poet who just sucks. I mean, he's a, he's a bad poet. But the reading of the poetry that this Bailey gave was one of was it was one of the most brilliant performances yeah. with a little bit of jazz bongo and right. stuff in the background, right. and it was brilliant. But it was all performance, not the words. It wasn't Kaufman. It was it was Bailey it was yeah. spin on Kaufman. Yeah. Well, now, okay. in in ninety four, okay. Dan and I uh, were at a reading. Uh, I, uh, it was either a Cahoots or the old Rosencrantz, and a poet named Kevin came up to us afterwards and he the whisperer re- yeah kevin the whisperer he, pomelo he, he yes he came up to us afterwards and he was very you know kneeling before us he, he, <laughs> he really admired us and uh, he'd seen us before and uh he uh, uh mr schneider uh mr wall would would you uh, critique some of my poems and and the first thing dan said was well who, who are your influences um i i i don't i don't read poetry I only write it. I, I don't like poetry. And Dan's like, you know, well, you're a second-rate Dr. Seuss. Get out of here, kind of a thing. But the one thing we told him was, uh, the one thing, <laughs> the one thing we did tell him was uh, your uh, your voice. He had this great voice, wow. and he could take the worst piece of crap poem, and women would melt when he read it. Huh. And we told you could him. Could probably read the phone book. That, yeah. You know, you know, oh yeah. And anatomy. we told him, yeah. don't lose the voice. And he took such a offense to that. Oh, he was mad. He just I wanted to remember. take us. I mean, I, I. Oh, he was so yeah. mad at us for saying that. Oh, I don't. I don't know, Dylan. You, you have a way of, I think, putting things in more filmic uh, terms. But anyway, um, all of life is a movie. Art, <laughs> I've always thought that art is communication, and that's, I think, one of the things that's lost. I mean, we talked a little bit. Uh, Early about uh, postmodernism. I mean, communication versus right. purely personal expression. Yeah, I mean, I want you know whether it, whether it's someone something written by me or something painted by me. The reason I do that and I don't just keep it in my mind is so that you or you or you or you at some future point are going to absorb this, whether you like it or not. It's it's it's. I mean, art basically is that primal yelp into the cosmos. I'm here, and I think once you acknowledge that you can move beyond that and do other things but I think a lot of artists try to deny that they they try to deny that art is communication art is about this thing I'm trying to express this idea or this thing and you don't get it you know I'm not a big fan of abstract expressionism or, or you know the movie of Jackson Pollock that was a couple of years ago I mean you know I think if he had done a handful of paintings uh, with his drip paintings and called it a series that would be yeah. interesting but when you do He's several serious. hundred and it's the same thing over and over again it loses the effect and mm-hmm. How, some how of that interior. some of that is the fashionableism fashionable 
fashionable, you know, cycle of isms, though, mm-hmm. too. I mean, yes. you know, the when you're... The culture at large. Exactly, yeah. which then which then feeds into a kind of cult of personality sometimes. Mm-hmm. But, but And some of it, frankly, is just marketing, too. Uh, you know, I will always I would, let's... Oh, go ahead. I would say instead of I am here, I might say it is here. I'm kind of an art for art's sake gal, and that's not popular right now. But, but you, but you want your name appended at the end of the poem. Don't tell me you don't. Um, I do, I do. Cinder Ham. That's right. She's a genius. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. But I, I mean, I would say that um, it, it's the expression of something through me, of mm-hmm. course. But, but I think when I read or write a poem, I'm interested in making it. Yeah. A world that the poem is about, not necessarily expressing my point of view, because I don't know it yet until I do it. Well, yeah, and that I, that's an, a, another thing too is a, a lot of times you have a lot of artists. I mean, there are many ways to approach art. There's no particular one way. There are times mm-hmm. when I'll sketch out the whole frame of what I want to do, and I just connect the dots. Other times, I'll take take it, and you know, I'm throwing the ball sure. someplace. Sure. But one of the things I've always thought uh, the most satisfying thing in art for me would be, you know, if in 10,000 years galaxies away some creature, you know, hits the galactic directory and looks up ancient world poets in minor galaxies, comes across a poem of mine, reads it and has that moment that goes, "Ah, he or it understood. That's what art is about. And that, that you know, you can talk. I mean, it would be nice if someone puts me in an anthology and says, you know, there's Schneider, there's Dunn, there's Shakespeare, there's what. But it, it, it's that, that effect that, that's, that says, oh, there was that person who had this experience. Bam. That, that to me is, uh, I think, missing in a lot of art. And I think it gets back to the singular versus the generic. If something is generic... We don't know who that is. It's it's misty. You know, Art Durkee, you know, it's like that flashback sequence. He's not there. But if Art writes a good poem, boom, there's Art. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the thing itself brings the, the author to the forefront. Yeah, and, I, and, yeah. and one of the things that's, I think, self-defeating about confessionalism is all art is going to be about the author. Uh, if I'm writing about Jesse James, that's because I've got some interest in Jesse James. You can divine that just what, well, he wrote a poem about Jesse James. He must have... Had an interest, Don. You look like plus, you're itching you're to say something. You're going to put some of your reflections no, no. No? on. Plus, I mean, you're going to reveal yourself uh, in the way that you present Jesse James. Yeah, you know your take on Jesse James. Right. Okay. That's yeah. that's revealing right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've always thought there's also a difference between being a great artist or poet and being a major artist or poet. The difference is the greatness comes with how good or how well the art itself succeeds. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are great artists that I don't think have had any influence. You can, we can talk all we want about Emily Dickinson, for example, in terms of influencing other poets uh, or, or having an influence on getting young female poets to write. But I don't think there's ever been a successor to her. I think she's sort of uh, an evolutionary dead end in poetry. No one has ever taken her stuff and gone beyond it. Whitman, on the other hand, without Whitman, there is no really modern poetry. You look at you go ahead, Dylan. Well, well, we don't know at this point about Angelou. We don't know at this point, you know, I mean, 20 years from now, you know, everyone might be saying, well, of course I learned from my Angelou. I mean, it's, it's too soon right now. I mean, I, I, I can't stand James Tate. Oh. But the d- day is going to come when people are going to say, yeah, well, I remember, you know, 20th century poetry. I really looked at that. And I really looked to the works of James Tate, you know. That's interesting because... One of my, one of the poets that got me started at writing poetry I discovered when I was fourteen was Conrad Aiken, and you never hear his stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. It's basically all out of print and non anthologized, and yet he had a sense of music that was so foreground um, that he even labeled some two or three of his best long poems symphonies, mm-hmm. and they work as mm-hmm. musical movements. Archibald mm-hmm. MacLeish is another mm-hmm. poet from that right. uh, same time period who's mm-hmm. who's neglected and conquistador is one of the one of the best oh. long poems yeah. of yeah. the twentieth century yeah. that's that's yeah. not uh, ever talked about. Um, but getting back to the idea about major, I, I think I can say safely, I don't think Maya Angelou is going to have an influence on real poets. Oh, I, Maya so. Angelou is going to influence, who's the, the singer girl? Um, oh, Jewel. Fiona. Jewel? No, yeah. Fiona Apple. Yeah. You know, she, you, you'll you get the Fiona Apples of the world sure. that will say that Maya Angelou is an influence. But I don't think that you're going to get someone like uh, this poet we had on earlier this year, James Emanuel, the next James Emanuel, or the next... Uh, Hopkins or the next, you know, fill in the blank, whoever's a really good poet, saying that any Angelou influenced him. I just don't see that. See, but you are also going to get people that will look at someone and say, she's the next Maya Angelou. It has nothing to do with the work. It has to do that she's a prominent black woman 
uh, in in poetry. Well, okay. they're going to confuse those lines. But that but that that sort of cultural influence versus specific artistic well, influence. I mean, I you know how how do you go beyond you know the? But whole, do they understand that? No, I I, I don't think they would. But you know, you, it, it, you can't really go much beyond the hallmark verse unless you want to imitate Leonard Nimoy. You know, <laughs> but, well, some of us do. Uh, we've got about uh, you know uh, eight or ten minutes left in, in the show. I just wanted to talk a little, touch a little bit about uh, granting and, and money giving uh, in the art arts scene. I generally would like to see the NEA abolished. I would like to see all no. the money taken away from anyone, and I like to see people fend for themselves because. I don't. I, I don't think it does any good except make a bunch of people just suck up and try to write. You disagree and go ahead. I, I would say uh, the NEA shouldn't be abolished. I think it should be completely burned to the ground and restructured. But I, I think the, the possibility is there for something that's well, uh, used to worthy. The NEA used to fund some very interesting worthy projects, yes. but then it kind of got killed with the whole Politics. Maplethorpe. Tim Miller, you know, the, the NEA 6 that Jesse Holmes went after, what, 10 years ago now or something like that? I forget what it was. When I was in Boulder, uh, uh, living outside of Boulder, Colorado, uh, very young, just starting to really write seriously, uh, a lot of the well-known poets down there told me, whatever you do, don't apply for grants, especially anyone that asks you for money because it goes, the judges give it to friends or other judges on the panel or something like that and that was their advice to me and and i've seen it you know all too often well the thing the thing that that gets me and uh, i pointed this out in certain essays when i've given the online bios of certain poets i, I just mentioned that i had done this one uh, about deborah keenan a local poet and she's done a lot of things with another local poet roseanne lloyd and recently a book that was awarded to deborah keenan as a prize roseanne lloyd was one of the judges now mm -hmm. it it seems to me that if i've co-edited something if you know if for example i ever were to sit on a board and anyone here in this room came up, I would have to absent myself. Even if I thought, say, the book that was submitted, the manuscript, well, let's say Don's long poem that I think should be published uh, yeah. and disseminated, I mean, I would absent myself because I could not, there's no way that I could, even if I could be objective, that I could give the reasonable appearance of being obje objective, having known him for a decade or so. But too often you see uh, so and so sits on this arts council. Right. They said, I mean, it's just like CEOs that sit on on the boards of other CEO, uh, other corporations. Well, how many times have we Go ahead, Jesse. You want to say no, something? No, it's just a very closed world that they don't let anyone in. Yeah, you know? and the prop and, and the biggest problem is, you know, it used to be a dead white male. Uh, old boys network and yet when the politically correct elitists came in yeah. they constructed a simulacrum it's the exact same yeah. thing you have become your own enemy and the, the stuff is just as bad slightly different but bad in its own way and, and how often have we seen it where you don't, the money's not going to the, I mean, it's going to the tenured professor who doesn't need the money rather than Adrian the Rich gets truly the, Adrian, need that money. the Adrian Riches of the Robert world. Bly, how get, many grants a year does Robert Bly get? I, I don't know, but an Adrian Rich gets a genius grant for 300000 yet some person who's working in a factory, you yeah. know, at eight bucks an hour doesn't. Don, you wanted to say something? Well, I mean, it's the combination of things. It's not just the NEA. I mean, it's the MFA programs yeah. and it's PC universities. I mean, it's all the wrong reasons to honor any particular artist. I mean, I don't think the NEA is that big a deal for poets, per se. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you want to throw some <laughs> it, terrible it, it, structure it, together yeah. and call it sculpture, I mean, you know, big money things that take real money. Yeah. Uh, Sindra, do you have any, I know, I know, because I know you have applied for grants in the past. Do you, I mean, do you, I mean, do you think that any good comes of it? Have you, I mean, can anyone name, for example, any book of poetry or any work of art majorly that was government funded in the last 20 years? I'd say. Well, at least in America. It, well, in America, okay, go. Well, just to play devil's advocate, I don't really have a problem with uh, government giving money to artists because I think that if government truly is a representation of how society works, then artists are in that society in a monetary or economic way as well. As for the issue that people seem to sit on the same boards or panels and, you know, um, grant each other, um, that can get to be a problem in some ways. I'm not sure how it's avoidable if you're in the scene and you know a but, lot of but, people. But, sim but simply you absent yourself. I yeah. mean, like I said, there, there are people, I mean... There are always going to be poets that apply. You, you, you get thousands of applications. Mm -hmm. If I see two dozen people that I know, 
I can't I can't comment on them. I mean, uh, you, 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 it's I mean, this is basic ethics. I mean, and, and I'm not saying I'm a choir boy, but if I saw a Do name, you know that that doesn't happen. Yes, I, I, and in fact, on yeah, my website, yeah. a fellow named Briggs Seekins a couple of years ago, who actually had a magazine called Salt, he had, had an essay detailing about, about this, this whole incestuous cycle. I mean, we know it happens. I've known people, for example, here in local uh, uh, organizations, whether it was The Loft, whether it was Forecast, which is a, a local Minnesota granting program, I forget for what. Uh, and they, I mean, you, you hear the same stories over and over again. I agree about... I have no problem with the government giving money for the arts. I totally agree with that. The problem that I... Um, my sister lives in Holland. My brother-in-law, uh, they both made their careers there. He's a musician. She's an artist, painter, um, um, etcher, you know. Um, he works for a state-funded organization. The, the wonderful thing about the way they do it in Holland, which they don't do here, is, is in Holland they say... You seem to have produced interesting work of merit. Here's a chunk of change. Mm. Do with it as you will. Mm -hmm. Produce you what you want. The problem that we have with the NEA and with government funding for the arts in the United States is because we live in a post-puritanical moralistic society, we apply too many strings. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. I, think it, I think it would be great if, if places like The Loft and Sassy and everybody else were totally well-funded so that nobody had to worry about the politics yes. of who they have to please and order to get the grant mm -hmm. in other words make it make it uh, make it a level playing field hey you've produced a book on your own that looks pretty good here do another one you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. maybe that's idealistic but it seems to work in Europe it work mm -hmm. it works well in Holland it works yeah, yeah. sort of well in France mm -hmm. not particularly well in Italy but very well in Germany yeah. Mm -hmm. for, for yeah. doing this sure. and, and a lot of very interesting work especially in Holland has come out that is incredibly controversial difficult and probably you know anti-state and yet the state funded it I think that's a delicious irony yes. of, of giving with no strings that, that, so it obviously can work but here I think that even if you implement that you know eventually you know they find a way to bastardize it well, just, that's it's it's just well, that's the, the, that's the problem with government. Uh, well, that's the problem with the mm -hmm. with with the society that that where everything has a market dollar right. lo bottom I line would agree value. With yes, that. I would agree with that. That's you why know. it doesn't well, work in America. That's why poetry is dying. And, yeah, and so right. many art forms are dying. Let's let's wrap this culture. up. And uh, uh, I actually was just reading a book uh, on a PBS series called Closer to the Truth. I was reading the the manuscripts of some of their shows. There was a show on uh, it's, it was a show talking about various aspects of science. And he always ended the show with, you know, give a forecast of where you think uh, this particular field will be in 100 years or so. So I just want to end uh, with, with the, the five people we have remain here. If you have any particular thoughts about poetry or la a last thought uh, on the art or the craft or your own poetry, we'll go around here. Sindra, do you have any final thought? I just think um, the imagination is underrated in this society. And um, I'm really interested in... Um, all sorts of subject matters and styles, but uh, but uh, we seem to be living in a society that values um, the experiential and identity in whatever way, and I think the imagination is just as valid an experience mm -hmm. in that way mm -hmm. and can, can add a lot of mm -hmm. um, pleasure and um, stimulation and challenge into poems. Robert Newkirk, mm -hmm. any final thought? Uh... I don't have any deep thoughts about poetry. I, I would uh, rather go home and uh, write some more than, than try to analyze it. <laughs> yeah. Jessica, any thought? No. No? Dylan? We've we forgot, we've lost what poetry is here. I'd say go back to the basics, uh, learn, a, learn, learn a new voice from it, um, slam poetry, it's not poetry. It, it, it incorporates some poetry maybe, but it's performance art. Call it for what it is. Hmm. Don Moss? Um, no, my only thought on it is, I mean, it's only going to be a small percentage of people who are going to pay any attention to it, and certainly even smaller that are going to go beyond those few poems that they maybe can recite a line or two of from school. Okay, well, thanks to all the poets who've been here talking about uh, poetry in general, the Twin Cities poetry scene more specifically, and at the bottom line, the Uptown Poetry Group, which went for 200 consecutive meetings for over eight years. Next month, <laughs> next, next, next month we're going to have uh, a fellow named Leonard Schlein uh, talking. He wrote a book called Art and Physics, and that should be interesting. And, uh, well, we'll see what happens, because uh, his latest book I wasn't too uh, kosher on, but uh, it'll, it'll be a, an interesting show. So Art, uh, Art, Art Durkee and myself, Art... 
Thanks, everyone. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.